everyone. We're back in person after over two years, and I'm glad that we have at least, you know, a uh, respectable audience here in person. We also have a um, an online audience. I can't know at the moment how many there are, but there were 370 people who registered. So I'm assuming that if we get half of them, there's going to be a lot of people following us uh, remotely. So welcome to those um, participants as well. I'm Robert Harrison, directing Another Look, having taken over the direct direction from Toby Wolf, the founder of this program. And um, we're delighted to be here to discuss another very interesting novel, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which uh, you say those two words, Jekyll and Hyde, everyone has an idea of what that means. And I don't think it would be an over exaggeration to say that it's one of the few real modern myths or archetypes, you know, Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, George Steiner, and I agree with him, says that, you know, after the Greeks, hardly any new archetypes were discovered. Uh, and maybe Hamlet, although Hamlet has a predecessor in Orestes and Aeschylus's Orestes, there's Don Giovanni, but, you know, as the seducer, but Don Giovanni also has a predecessor in Jason. Um, anyway, Jekyll and Hyde is a modern archetype. And he's, while so many people know what the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is, I'm not sure how many of you had read the novel before this evening. And I certainly had not read it until about 10 years ago. And when I took it off the shelf, I was really astonished at the uh, artistry and craftsmanship and the storytelling. And I think that one of the problems we have these days is that since we know how it ends, namely that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are the same person, uh, we lose that element of suspense that must have been so enormous for the original readers of the book when it was published in 1886, that they're actually the same person. So um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion of this novel. Uh, but just one or two announcements before we start. I wanted to thank again Cynthia Haven, who during the COVID uh, years, you know, kept us going you know, with the, um, the Zoom meetings that we've had. And she's one of the few people I know who during COVID has thrived, you know, in her publications. Unbelievable how much she's managed to, to do. I think the last time we were here in person, she had already published her biography of Rene Girard, Evolution of Desire, like 2018. And yet a year later, she published Conversations with Rene Girard, the prophet of envy with Bloomsbury. She then went on in 2021 to come out with a splendid uh, book on uh, Czeslaw Milos called a, a California Life. It deals with Milos in California. Very interesting. It's been getting some uh, exalted reviews recently. And in the same year, she also published a book called The Man Who Brought Brodsky to English, Conversations with George Klein came out with Academic Studies Press in 2021. And the editor of this book, Kate Yan, I'm told is probably maybe joining us uh, in the Zoom uh, box in, uh, from abroad. And if that were not enough, she has two more books coming out in the next year or two. So congratulations to Cynthia Haven. We're, as usual, very lucky that she's... Uh, keeping another look going. So tonight we have um, Toby Wolf, obviously, well known to all of you. I don't need to introduce him, but I will introduce Anna Ilievska, who uh, hails from Macedonia originally. And she is um, a young scholar who received her PhD in comparative literature in 2020 from the University of Chicago. Um, currently, she's an Andrew Mellon Fellow, postdoctoral fellow here at Stanford, and she specializes in 19th and 20th century um, literature, focusing on the relationship between literature, the Industrial Revolution, and technology from a Southern perspective, Southern European pr perspective, I guess. 
um, would be more precise. And I, um, you know, I'm tempted to say all sorts of things about the novel we're reading, but I'm going to restrain myself because I want to hear from uh, first Anna and then Toby, and then we will open it up to discussion. So welcome Anna to another look, and we're going to pass the word to you. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you for this invitation. I feel very humbled to be sitting next to, to such important figures of American <laughs> and Italian and French literature. <laughs> so I'm going to try to bring my perspective onto this book that I think I read as a child in Macedonia, probably in Serbo Croatian. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, a bit louder. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the 90s in a post-socialist... I don't know if you, maybe the microphone would help or not. Well, maybe it's not even on. I think it's on the top. I haven't touched it as well. Okay. Yeah, I think it's on the top. Okay, I have to hold the microphone. <laughs> All right, so I was just saying thank you for this invitation, Robert, and uh, nice to meet you, Toby. It's really humbling to be next to these incredible figures of American and Italian and French literature. So I was saying that I would try to bring my perspective onto the book that I think I read as a child in Macedonia, probably in the Serbo-Croatian translation. So there are several layers between me and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And yet I have this myth in common with all of you. We all know of the story. So I was just trying to kind of figure out what is it that I can bring to the table. Well, first of all, I grew up in the 90s in post-socialist Macedonia, uh, whatever was the aftermath of Yugoslavia. Um, but growing up in the 90s for me meant uh, most of all three things. First of all, we were imbued with a kind of sense of shared humanity. I remember going to school and we all talked about this brotherhood of, of all the nations in the, in the world. So there was a sense of kind of something with the fall of the Berlin Wall and with the end of the Soviet Union has kind of shoved us or pushed us into a community that is somehow something to be cherished. So a lot of, there was a lot of talking about uh, humanitarian interventions, about charity, about doing good, it being inclusive, being diverse. So this was one of the first narratives that I, I kind of was uh, was uh, exposed to as a child. The second one was uh, the narrative surrounding the climate and the planet. I remember in my school, there was a poster on the wall that said, we don't have a second planet. So I remember already as a child thinking about how precious this place is in which we live and we have to think about how to protect it, how to think about the environment a bit more. And the third uh, development was of course the internet boom. Although I am technically a millennial, I still remember times before the internet, so that makes me so much older than my freshman students here at Stanford. <laughs> the gap is really significant. So I remember when the internet boom happened, when we first had uh, um, emails, we had Messenger, we had all these chats where you could assume a different reality of yourself. You could uh, choose an avatar. You can choose a completely anonymous name that could be whatever. I, I think my first email was something like freeminder at hotmail.com. And I felt so proud of it because it allowed me to be something else, something different. So we had these three moments in the 90s that my generation felt, and I can speak only for myself, but maybe people would share this narrative who were born around that time, that we felt a connection with humanity that something, some kind of urge towards doing good, um, engaging in charitable humanitarian actions. Then there was the narrative of uh, protecting the climate, thinking about the planet. And then the third one was this idea that you could become anything you want, that you could live out your multiple identities, you could move socially, and the internet, aka technology, played an enormous role in this. The fact that we could play video games in which you could change your body, you could assume a completely different identity was something that my generation grew up with and opened up incredible, bound, incredible opportunities into the world. And today we have this kind of uh, extension of this identity game, doubling, tripling multiplicity uh, through social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, dating apps, uh, academia, EDU profiles, uh, what else do we have, LinkedIn, in which we all have a different identity. So in a way, we have lived through the dream of Dr. Jekyll, that man is not just one, but double, and we're multiple nowadays. So in a way, we have passed the Jekyll and Hyde litmus test, if I can call it, 
call it that. So this just to give you a framework from where I approach this, this book as I'm trying to see what is it in there that is relevant to me. Uh, and I remember uh, as a teenager, I heard this song that maybe many of you don't know. It's by a singer called Meredith Brooks. But for women of my generation, it was important. It had a very an unsavory title, uh, Bitch, from 1997. But it was from the perspective of a woman who was saying that uh, she's a little bit of everything all rolled into one. She's a child. She's a lover. She's a mother. She's a sinner. She's a saint. And I do not feel ashamed. So take me as I am, she was saying. So this, as a girl growing up in the Balkans at the time felt very liberating. Like you could be all these contradictory things at the same time. And that was okay. That was perfectly acceptable. So somehow when I was reading this book, I kept thinking about this line that man is not truly one, not truly two, but perhaps many today. Uh, and this kind of duplicity, this kind of double life implies a certain kind of lack of accountability, lack of obligation, which is what we get today on the internet. When we get on the internet and form our identities, we are not really accountable for whatever we do that. There is a separation between our lives. So I kept thinking about this and kept thinking about this line on page 46, at least in my edition, where, where uh, Jackal is describing the immateriality of the body. The body is transient. It's something sem seemingly so solid which we kind of can change and can switch so we can experience different kinds of identities, different parts of ourselves. So we have transcended in a way today this idea of a solid immutable identity. We are not only confined to one role, but we inhabit several roles in our society as individuals and we can get away with it, unlike, unlike uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So I kept thinking, what is this motif of the double, of the doubling of the self? And please interrupt me if I'm over oh, my no, no, 10, no, 15 no, minutes. Ahead, ahead, Thank you. So this led me to think, what is it, this fascination of us having multiple identities? Is it universal? Uh, and on page 48 of my edition, uh, Jackal says that all human beings have this duplicity in them. We're all made up of good and evil. We all kind of lead a double life. So I was thinking, what prompted this motif of the double? Is this true that this is a universal characteristic that all human beings somehow feel double in themselves? Or is it a privilege? Is it historically determined? Is it class determined? Apologies. Um, uh, is it class related? Is it somehow something reserved to a specific kind of people? Or is it truly something, something universal? So this kind of made me think about what, again, what does it mean to, to double? And where does this idea come from? So uh, who is able to be a double? Who can be a double? And why? Can a woman, just like Jekyll, uh, become a double? Can a slave become a double? Can a servant become a double? And what does this mean? So as uh, may, maybe some of you already intuited, I went to Freud for this, and I'm not gonna go into the castration complex because at the end of the day, Freud thinks doubling has to do with the fear of castration, castration. but he did write uh, in his famous um, 1919 essay on the uncanny that the double, I quote, was originally an insurance against the extinction of the self. It's an energetic denial of the power of death. So we double ourselves where, when, when we feel threatened by something, where it's about survival. That's where the human being somehow creates a double of itself, no matter what the connotations of it are. Um, so somehow doubling has to do with survival. One isn't enough, but two might be enough. And I recently spoke to an economist friend of mine about this doubling, and he told me that how, I guess in economics or mathematical theory that has to do with human psychology, humans take one for granted, two is a necessity, three we keep track of. Somehow two is a necessary number for survival. That's what allows us to deny death, to think of immortality, but not three. Three is too much. That's already, we can't remember it in our minds. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, thing. All right, so doubling has to do with a, moment, with a moment of crisis. And it has to do for Freud with a certain kind of primitive narcissism. And please feel free to discard this because it's very loaded. A primitive narcissism, he says, that dominates the mental life of the child and the primitive man. So somehow in our narcissism, we double ourselves as a way of protecting ourselves, but then eventually we overcome this narcissism and this doubling to become a unity again, and that's a mature kind of state. And when we become one again, then the double becomes an object of terror. 
we look back at this double and we reject it. We don't want to be it anymore. And I think we see these resonances in the book uh, in Dr. Jekyll and Ms. Hyde. So I'm wondering then, what is this crisis at the core of Stevenson's novella that prompts Dr. Jekyll's doubling? What does this novel respond to by creating this doubling? Can we think... I mean, I was just thinking, I, I think I've read significantly less novels that my, than my uh, uh, interlocutors tonight, but in my, in my life, I've read a significant amount of novel, I think, for just, you know, uh, someone who studies literature. And I haven't been able to think of this specific idea in fiction between, before the 19th century, necessarily, not in this kind, not in this kind of extreme idea of, of creating something else in addition to yourself as a way of responding to a certain kind of crisis. So what is it about the 19th century that brings us these narratives? And I think here of Frankenstein, Frankenstein could be read as a certain kind of doubling novel where we have Victor, the scientist who creates a monster and there's a constant confusion between the two because they both are somehow named Frankenstein. One is human, the other one is not, but they spill into one another. And I'm thinking of all the machines, the automata that start populating fiction in the 19th century as other humans as an additional human. So I'm, I was like, why, why is this happening in, in the 19th century? Where? Well, we, we see on page 45 in my edition that uh, Jekyll is described as being having been born, I quote, to a large fortune endowed with excellent parts, inclined to industry, fond of respect, honorable and distinguished. He will have an honorable and distinguished future. So we have a very kind of typical male of the upper class here of the 19th century, uh, a scientist, there's a fascination with the labor laboratory, with the drugs that happen around here. And as he's growing up, we have in the 19th century, in England in particular, the peak of the industrial revolution. That means factories, machines, vehicles, transportation. There's an enormous impact on the senses, on the human senses that humans all of a sudden have to deal with. If before the 19th century, humans were used to a certain kind of feudal structure in which every individual has its, had their own assigned place in the world, their own role, their specific trajectory. With the Industrial Revolution, with the coming of machines and industry, this was destabilized. All of a sudden, there are multiple realities out there. Uh, all of a sudden, society becomes a, a very complex Russian doll structure that has multiple rooms multiple narratives as the, also the novel shows us with all the envelopes, with all the corridors, the cellars that we see. And people can move between these different rooms. They're allowed to cohabit in the same city. We have the neighborhood of Soho we, where, where uh, Hyde is hiding. And we have the neighborhood of the former architects or the for, former medics. And we have the aristocracy that are all in the same city and they encounter each other. So this in a way leads this is my kind of reading of the novel, to a destabilization, fragmentation of identity of, who, of any human at the time. How do I respond to this multiplying reality around me? So I think the kind of the answer that we have in this book is to give birth to another self. And scholarship has called this act of 19th century male writers in particular, the creation of motherless creatures, motherless creations. Frankenstein is an example, uh, E.T.A. Hoffman's Olympia Automaton is an example where the male tries to uh, create another self as without the help of a woman, without the help of nature, as a way of confronting this new destabilizing, incredible reality that is there in front of, in front of him. Uh, right, so uh, he speaks even in the book we see at the first breath of this new life. He speaks of how he crossed a yard wherein the constellations looked down upon me with wonder, the first creature of that sort. So the response to this crisis of modernity, of modernity that we today, we we live on a on hundred degree, even more so, right? But the response in the industrial revolution was this kind of doubling of the self, this kind of managing of the stimuli of the world through the creation of multiple personality. And I think this is a unique and perhaps the first moment in history, literary history, that this has happened as such. All right, I can go on quite quite a lot into this topic, but I also want to- fascinating, yeah, go on, yeah, I, go on, yeah. Just, just one, more, one more connection to yeah. this. So this was like, the first one is kind of this, the, the 
crashing down of the social hierarchies, people mixing, social miscegenation, the ability to climb the social ladder, to be in different places with very different people. Before you could just ride your own coach with your own horses and only be in the company of your own of your own class. But with the Industrial Revolution, you were surrounded by all sorts of different people. So how do you manage this kind of plurality? By redoubling yourself. And then another thing that I wanted to mention, um, another response that this, this, novel is, this novel is giving is, of course, to the whole idea of science and technology, to uh, its questioning reason, is questioning the enlightenment idea of man is a rational animal, and that by that we can kind of face modernity face on, or it, it inserts improbability, it inserts instinct, and it inserts the base also as a form of, of, of creatureliness, of, leave, of living as a form of another kind of life. And from, from here, uh, we have the conversation between Lanyon uh, and, and, and Utterson, where Lanyon says, well, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Jekyll at a certain time, at a certain point became uh, uh, um, prone to unscientific balderash, he says it, because he wants to create this other being. But would this novel have been possible without the Industrial Revolution, without mm -hmm. the London fog, which is not fog, it's pollution. This is mere pollution that we witness in this novel that is kind of glorified. But I'm thinking, would this novel, a specifically Gothic novel, been able to, been written, to have been written before this era where you didn't have factories uh, bringing down the great chocolate-colored pall lowered over the heavens of London, and which they called the first fog of the season, but apparently was the arrival of smog, basically, of pollution in, in London at the time. So this entire Industrial Revolution context kind of creates not just the, the identity of the character, the plot of the novel in a way, but also the setting for the novel. I, I believe that this novel wouldn't have been possible without these influences. It couldn't have been written in the south of Sicily, of Italy at the time in the 19th century. It can only be situated in London with those specific historical uh, circumstances. So I would, I would stop here for a second and then maybe we can continue later on. Thank you. Well, there's a great, uh, that's uh, the one thing I do take credit for is choosing the discussants for another look, because I think <laughs> it's a prime example of, uh, you know, uh, a great discussion underway. Amen. So Toby, I think I'm gonna let you go on. I have plenty of things to respond to, but we'll. I, I, I will pick up in a way where you left off with the fog. Um, I think that's, that's, uh, a wonderful thing to look at in this uh, novel. And it owes a lot to uh, Dickens, I think. There's a, uh, a justly famous uh, opening to, to one of Dickens' novels, Bleak House, in which he evokes the fog in ways very similar to Stevenson here. Uh, it takes on... Uh, uh, a, a personality, it, it gives the city a kind of personality almost. And he, uh, I think Stevenson was in fact, probably influenced by uh, Dickens' description in Bleak House because there's a funny word that Dickens uses um, in his description of the fog there. He says, uh, even the, the street light, the light from the street lights has a haggard, unwilling look. And here in uh, Stevenson's, uh, uh, he talks about uh, light breaking through a gap in the clouds with a, uh, a haggard shaft of daylight. It's such a peculiar word. And, um, and I think a tip of the hat uh, to, uh, to Dickens very well known passage, which, which uh, people would I'm sure have been aware of then. Um, one, one, my wife Catherine and I were talking about the novel. She read it uh, as as well, and uh, she said something which I think is really true: uh, that uh, we 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 wish we could have read this novel without knowing about it first, mm. as the first readers approached it, uh, because it has already been so mythologized uh, and has taken so many forms, it's become a metaphor in our daily speech when we're talking about somebody who 
would seem to be one kind of person and but has this other side uh it is as you said it it's, it's become a kind of iconic image and there are very very few of them of that with that kind of power and eloquence um one, one of the things that it, that i i mean I, I i find the novel uh, uh uh intriguing and its structure the way it works through those different points of view and the letters um uh and almost uh uh the the, the grotesquerie of, of the beginning of, of him trampling this little girl, uh, the vagueness around uh, Hyde's features. Even when uh, Utterson says, show me your face, he never really describes it. It's just, it's malformed. There, that's a word that comes up again and again. Um, and, and it is described abstractly as it's called this quality of, of, of unease that it produces in those who look at it and that it ascribes to a kind of evil. Uh, but what this gets at so beautifully, this novel, uh, uh, Wright Morris in his book about, uh, uh, in his book, uh, uh, The Territory I Had, makes a sort of distinction between what he considers to be essentially a romance uh, and the greater literature. And the distinction he, tends, he, he sees is that uh, the romance is about character struggle with the world around them, outside them, uh, nature, other people, social structures, that sort of thing. And, uh, and the, the greatest, literature in his view is that that, that describes uh, the battle within, the battle people fight with themselves. And this is that kind of a novel. Uh, it's intriguing to me that uh, both Utterson and obviously especially Jekyll um, are conscious of and, uh, and, and guilty about some sin, some, some kind of uh, wishes and conduct that uh, they need to in somehow suppress uh, or dissemble. Uh, the closest we get to any kind of accounting of that is Jekyll talking about uh, uh, disorderly sensual images running through his mind. And that's, that's about as close as, as we get to what it actually is. And maybe that doesn't really matter. What matters is that there is something in their nature of which they are ashamed. Uh, and that uh, in Jekyll's case, he takes extra measures uh, uh, to live with. And his way of living with it is to create another creature within himself or to give that creature within himself license to live without consciousness of shame, without conscience, that is. And, uh, and I love this, uh, this description of it. Uh, he plods in the public eye with a load of genial respectability, but like a schoolboy, he loves to strip off these lendings, lendings, what a word, and spring into the sea of liberty. So that uh, what he's really, it, it, it gets a little more complicated here than what we might think. It, it isn't just his sense of shame that he's escaping by abstracting it into this other creature that he becomes. What he's really escaping is the, um, is the, are the constraints of respectability, that that is a kind of cage for him. Uh, and and the, even the regard of others, it's that public face that he is aware of presenting, which begins to feel like a mask in which he is imprisoned, that Hyde gives him liberty from, uh, so that, uh, it, it isn't an attraction so much to evil itself as to liberty, but liberty without constraint, 
And, uh, and unfortunately that also means giving rein to his, to his impulses as well. His rages, which everyone experiences and controls, uh, all those sorts of things, which, uh, which respectability uh, 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 contain in us are let loose. He even has a, a phrase here that uh, his, his, the, he had kept the beast too long chained and released it roared. And that's him on, on his tear. So uh, it's a, I think it's a, it's a, a wonderful and rather complicated uh, way of talking about how our nature, uh, uh, the different sides of our nature uh, negotiate with each other, subdue each other, sometimes let that let them let each other off the leash for a while, uh, often to our regret. Uh, but it is it's a it's a it's it's a it's a great inner drama in that way. I think. Thanks, Toby. Thank you. So, I I don't have a prepared spiel. I, I just will be the first responder to you know both of your comments first um, with regard to Anna. You know, it might be worthwhile to read that passage about the fog. The first fog of the season, a great chocolate colored pall lowered over heaven, but the wind was continually charging and routing these embattled vapors. So that as the cab crawled from street to street, Mr. Utterson beheld a marvelous number of degrees and hues of twilight. For here it would be dark like the back end of evening, and there it would be a glow of a rich lurid brown, like the light of some strange conflagration. And here for a moment, the fog would be quite broken up and a haggard shaft of daylight would glance in between the swirling wreaths. So I think just that quote corroborates what you were saying about a city which is made up not of a single identity, but it has a multiplicity of things mm -hmm. going on. So that fog gives the chiaroscuro of many different aspects to the environment. And yet, when we look at the concoction, the elixir of Dr. Jekyll's medicine, I mean, we find that it's many hued, it's described as being many hued, and it throws off fumes of vapor. And you could say that these uh, fumes of vapor seem to have been bottled from this London soup of fog of this kind of thing, and that the whole story is smoked and vaporized in a fantastic way. So um, yes, the fog, I think, functions as a very important symbol of the thematics that, that Anna was referring to. Now, clearly, we're not talking only here about human personality. We're talking about um, maybe something that's common to all people, all the characters in the novel, that there is a duplicity or a multiplicity in each one of us, as you were saying, the industrial revolution has multiplied the, you know, the possible selves that one person can have. And uh, one has to then ask about the other characters. What is, Utterson I think is maybe the most sane, he, there's indications that he had temptations in his youth and some of them he regrets, some indiscretions, but he, he's very thankful that he did not act on certain impulses that would have maybe exposed him to uh, the misfortune of being blackmailed. So restraint yeah. and the pressures of respectability maybe saved him from that. We cannot ever overestimate how much Victorian England uh, in the middle classes, the professional classes, was held hostage to reputation. Yeah. Yeah. And how easy it was for blackmailers to lord over certain people when they had discovered um, behaviors that were uh, inadmissible, respectable. So <clears throat> in that respect, there, there's duplicity belongs to all of us, not just to this one character. Everyone, 
it seems like every major character in the book lives with a certain um, secret life. I mean, come on, Enfield, who is you know the friend of Uderson, and they get together on Sundays for their you know, kind of sacred ritual. What is he doing at three o'clock in the morning? You know, walking down a dark winter you know street in London, and coming across you know Mr. Hyde. He's also described as a cheerful kind of person, and with you know a man about town. A man about town, <laughs> and you know. Clearly here in, in England, the, the, the laws against homosexuality are what was called uh, gross indecency. It was a very vague category, but you could uh, easily be um, imprisoned for life for, for certain kinds of behavior. But here is uh, um, here's a suggestion that, you know, that's another thing about the novel. I think that there's a lot of pockets of silence. So much that is not said by the narrator and the narrators. And it's like that sin that refuses to be named. So it's a, the unnamed thing. And you, you spoke earlier about you know, the motherless uh, fantasy of creating a new creature without mothers. There are no women. I mean, the women in the story are there. There's one or two women characters. There's a maid who oversees you know, the murder. There is uh, the housekeeper of Hyde, I guess. Uh, uh, but all of this coterie of friends they don't have wives, they're, they're wiveless. And um, Jekyll seems to suggest that there, there might be uh, his youthful appetites were illicit. So I'm not trying to push some kind of easy, you know, simplistic sort of um, reading that, uh, you know, we can reduce all this to the, the Victorian drama of, uh, it, a kind of illicit sexuality or an inadmissible sexuality. But what I'm trying to suggest is that what Anna is saying about the industrial revolution and the way the, let's say the duplicity of the main character, Jekyll and Hyde can apply to London itself. Hmm. We have these streets where you have respectable houses on the one side and side by side with them, there are these others. Even Jekyll's house, the front, the facade of the house is a very genteel, beautiful Victorian thing. And then in the back, it's um, a dilapidated sort of structure. Right. And it used to be a dissecting room, no? Mm -hmm. And Hyde comes in from the backside, Jekyll from that yeah. side. But London itself is so beautifully described where these streets are promiscuous. They go from uh, you know, the respectable professionals to, to the worst sort of criminals. So London itself, suffers from a Jekyll Hyde uh, sort of syndrome. Yeah. And of course, one of the two women that you mentioned, uh, uh, the housekeeper in Soho is described, I love this, uh, uh, her face having a certain evil that is smoothed over with hypocrisy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, even the women, uh, few as they are, participate in this doubleness. Right. And so I, I'm glad to hear that. I think that all of us would agree that this, to say that this is a story about good and evil, it's no. Mm -hmm. I mean, because clearly Jekyll is not the good side and Hyde is the bad side. Jekyll is the one who is addicted to the Hyde yes. uh, freedom <laughs> that you were talking about, the yeah. license that he, and that he uses the disguise of yeah. Hyde in order to gratify certain desires that his society uh, doesn't approve of. And that therefore, it's almost like an existential drama here about how the, this character willfully chooses through his own choices and actions, what kind of uh, person he wants to be. Yeah. And this kind of externalization in Hyde is, I think uh, Jean-Paul Sartre would call it an act of bad faith. Mm -hmm. No, it's my bad side that's doing it. It's not my side. Well, it's, you know, it's you who is choosing time and time again to become Mr. Hyde. And I think that that also is um, in, related to his, his will, where why does he leave his, all his money in the case of his death or disappearance to Hyde? 
is because he wants Hyde to have the means to go on gratifying, mm -hmm. you know, certain animalistic uh, appetites and desires uh, if he were to choose never to go back into right. the Jekyll mode, no? So I think there's a lot of, uh, yeah. the fact that even the self is multiplied, I think there is a, I, I don't know if you will agree with it, a singular subjectivity at work mm -hmm. that says, okay, I have these sides, it's my choice, I'm going to indulge. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is a pilot for sure. So many interesting uh, things to talk about. I mean, I agree that this novel is far than just a novel about good and evil. It lends itself to so many interpretations. This is why in the beginning, I kind of brought up my, my coming of age story because I feel it resembles the kind of the, the predicament, so to say, in which uh, Hi uh, Dr. Jekyll finds himself at the time, exactly a hundred years before I was born, in which he has a certain kind of predetermined way in which he needs to behave, right? This kind of comment, he's very charitable, we read in the book. He, he gives to the church, he invites all of his plates, he wants to do good. He really wants to live up to the ideal of society. And yet there's something in him, something extra that is not allowed any kind of life. So he externalizes it through technology, through the use of science to produce this kind of drug, which we today do through virtual realities or, or kind of metaverse nowadays and or kind of other, other technological uh, uh, efforts. So to, start, to, to give a response, I, I really like this idea. Yeah, uh, I have two students of mine here, Andrew and Chris from the English department, PhD students, and we discussed this a little bit among ourselves. And we also wondered what keeps this reading? We have this novel, we know what's gonna happen. We, we, when we read Frankenstein even, we know what's gonna happen. What keeps us reading this novel? I mean, be, besides the incredible wisdom that is there in between the lines, maybe you would agree that there were all these little bits and pieces like the face uh, smoothed over by hypocrisy that was just so well described that we kind of we missed this language in the era of Twitter uh, and very uh, restrained kind of uh, utterances. So what keeps us reading? Besides knowing the plot, I think this has to do with that feeling of the uncanny that is created from the beginning of the novel. And how is the uncanny, the, the unheimliche, this unheimliche in German, this feeling of, of the, uh, you see something and it provokes terror, it's somehow familiar, but not quite, we can't really pin it down to one thing or the other. Uh, well, again, to go back to, to Freud, uh, something for him, the uncanny arises from the idea that there's something that should have been repressed, but it's coming to the fore or something that perhaps seems human, but we're not sure about it. And I feel this is exactly the definition of high. Throughout the entire novel, we don't really, the words that are used to describe it are very, uh, uh, they are, they are inorganic, there's, there's something mm -hmm. unnatural about him, nothing human, he's a troglodytic kind of subject. And at a certain point, we, none of the characters know how to describe his face, mm -hmm. right? There's a constant, complete absence of like, we, we know there's something wrong, but what is, what is it? We can't really pin it down. So I feel in many ways, the book could have been called the, the uncanny case of Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde, because there is this kind of feeling of something's wrong, but we don't know why that is the definition of the uncanny. So I think through this somehow keeping us, keeping the, the kind of our understanding at bay from whatever is really happening there keeps us going. And there is a, phrase that I really, really like by uh, Thomas Aquinas, that is, uh, the truth is adequatio re et intellectus. Truth is the according, the accordance, the identification between what the thing is and what we understand it to be. Hmm. So as long as those, those things are discrepant, we keep reading. We keep wondering what is going on. What is really, is he good? Is he bad? Is this Hyde? Is it, we're wondering about the process of how we're going to intellectualize who belongs to what. So I feel that there, there's something, there's something about the uncanny that really keeps us going in this book to understand eventually why, why the book itself is interesting besides the plot. So this is kind of like the answer, my answer to what keeps us reading. And then um, I want to answer the question about women. Obviously, as a woman, when I read this book, and the lack of women is very, it screams into our faces, right? There are all these maids that just cry and they're only, uh, they're being told to shut up because uh, you get your bearings together at a certain point. I think Utterson says to one of the maids, uh, well, I, I read a letter that 
um, Henry James, uh, the famous American uh, British author, wrote about this book, uh, review, so to say, in which he says that actually that is the biggest achievement of this book. If we contextualize it within the history of the novel, the, the novel usually was perceived uh, up until the late 19th century as a divertissement uh, entertainment for women in idleness. And usually it was about women. Novels had women as central characters. And that provided the kind of the affect of the book. So Henry James wrote that it is, uh, it is Stevenson's achievement to have uh, 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 managed to create, to elicit emotion from the reader without having a woman as a main character. So I, I, we, can, we can either read him as, as a total misogynist uh, or something like that, or we can historicize the narrative and, and say, it was a kind of a feat to write a novel without the help of a female character because the female character automatically meant that there is gonna be some drama in the, in the novel. So what would a drama look like without a man, uh, without a woman. And this that's the product of that thought is Dr. Jekyll and, and Mr. Hyde, all right? Uh, let me see if I wanted to, um, yeah, of course the, the idea, I, I, I would, I'm sure there are plenty of uh, queer studies uh, scholarship that has been done on this novel because it lends itself really easily to the, to the whole transgender, uh, um, Gender, but just the idea that one is not quite at home in one's own body, and then one ha then one can have a different kind of access to a different to a whole kind of truth if one is to be set in another body. I think that kind of reading can be easily seen uh, in this novel, which again shows how this novel is so it, it's a classic. It's what we will call classic because after a hundred years, it speaks to our own still speaks in a quite innovative and striking way to our own, to our own uh, uh, concerns from today. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things that I, I, I find interesting in this uh, uh, split that happens in, in Jekyll is what he himself says about it which is it, his, it's his uh, obsession with virtue and being uh, uh, his ever higher aspirations and, uh, is what creates, and he uses this peculiar word, the deepest trench in his nature that, that it, he, you know, with this uh, living as a man in public, with the attention of a public upon him and expecting this kind of virtue, asking it of himself constantly, uh, that that is in a sense what creates the possibility of Hyde uh, mm -hmm. because it doesn't take into account the, actual, uh, the actuality of a human being. Uh, that will find, and that, you know, obviously uh, Freud, uh, had insights uh, into that uh, uh, kind of oppressive thing we do and what yeah. the consequences of that are. But uh, this is so dramatically realized here. And, uh, uh, but, I, but, the, but it isn't so much the, his, uh, uh, his sense of sin that creates Hyde the possibility of Hyde, but his obsession with being and seeming virtuous. I think that's it. So it, taking up on that and the notion of the uncanny, the uncanny, the, you mentioned the German word, unheimlichkeit, means unhomely. And the uncanny is where that which is familiar, that which in your own home, all of a sudden reveals a strangeness, no? Mm -hmm. So, and Anna talked about, and you also mentioned, people are not able to describe why he is so repulsive, that there seems to be a malformation or a deformity, but they can't, they can't point to what is deformed in his appearance. And the kind of universal disgust that Hyde elicits from people, I think is an indication that what they see in him horrifies them because they're seeing something in themselves yeah. in, in potentia that has been externalized. Mm -hmm. So in other words, that Hyde is all of us, that we all have a Hyde as you're suggesting. And 
you know, it, it, if one wants to get really outside of the safety zone of the reader, then you have to start interrogating oneself, you know, as, a, as an individual, like where is this other un, unhomely thing, uncanny thing in myself? And, and then you, if you want to universalize or say it's the city of London, you know, the hypocrisy with which a certain class uh, lived, in, you know, with privilege when, uh, and all the misery that's going on. Uh, and then, you know, if, if we want to get even closer to home, you can say, well, yeah, this American Republic of ours is very much like Jekyll, the way you describe, we have this insistence of, of virtue. We, we're devoted to virtue. We want to be the virtuous and think. And when we when uh, we've engaged in, you know, wars of certain, you know, uh, stuff and, and all this Mr. Hyde aspects of a nation's history, which um, we are very eager to say that's not really who we are. Right. That's just, mm -hmm. unfortunately, yeah. we, 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 we can enter into the fierce savagery of war and, and you know, napalm bombs in Vietnam and, and this and that and the other and all these hundreds of thousands of, of civilians in Iraq dead. And they, well, that's not really who we are, but it is who we are at the same time, you know? So I, I think that if you take it uh, radically as an existential self-interrogation, it's, it's very unsettling mm -hmm. to, uh, it, it doesn't lead us, leave us many hiding places for, to say that I, I where we can identify only with our virtue yeah. and not our uh, degradation, so. Yeah, uh, we kind of spoke about this earlier over wine, like Utterson and his colleagues, but yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to think how we, how we can make this book further productive about the current culture in which we live in. And I'm thinking about cancel culture and thinking about what it means today to have different identities. Have we, I said before that maybe in a way we have passed the Jekyll and Hyde, Hyde litmus test that in a way we do allow today for people to kind of live out the different aspects of their life, whether that be virtually, whether it be in any kind of uh, transitory state, uh, we, we, we embrace diversity and we encourage people to live out their drives in a certain way. But then I'm thinking, but all of that is so public right? Yeah. Everything that we live today, every kind of change in our identity, every separate identity that we create, we need to be completely accountable for to the public, which is what kind of, we're all, there, there's always the fear of the cancel culture. There's the fear that like Jekyll has to stain one's name right. publicly, exactly. right? That maybe yeah. one would say something wrong, will be canceled completely right. from any kind of other. And for instance, Luigi Pirandello, the Sicilian Nobel uh, Prize winner that I, I study most, he at the beginning of the 20th century came up with this idea that because of this fragmented reality that demands, that pose so many demands on the human, we have created these masks and be behind which we hide, hide with a, with a Y, I can, <laughs> you can play on it the whole night, uh, which we hide. So we have a mask for every kind of aspect of society. And this seems to have been somehow the definition of the 20th, 21st centuries, the creation of personae that we perform in, in different situations. So, so, so are we then, does that mean, we were mentioning this over dinner before, so there's, we're not allowed basically to hide anymore, any kind of secret identity that we might, that we might, might want to cherish. I mean, I'm not speaking of trampling over little children, of course, but any kind of idiosyncrasy that one wants to cultivate is not allowed anymore. It needs to be public. It needs to be justified. It needs to be really, narrated in a certain way. Whereas like in this novel, there is still, right, just as the name of the character suggests, there's still the idea that one could separate one difference, one's different identities and somehow not be accountable for all of them. So are we in a way in a more repressed <laughs> stage today in which we're not allowed to separate the identities and hide them, but are completely held accountable in every aspect? Only those of you who are on social media, because I don't have any social media <laughs> yeah. account. I cannot be canceled. Yeah. Right. Should we open it? Yeah. yeah, I think we should open it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. great so, question. Yes. Open it up. Great question. So let me uh, first mention, since this is being recorded in Zoom, oh, no. we are going to open it up now to Q&A from, from all of you here in person, but also 
to our online audience, right, Cynthia? And I don't know if we have, for those of you who are tuning in remotely, if you want to pose a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box and not the chat box, okay? Uh, and those of you who are here wanting to make a comment or raise a question, would you please come to the microphone here in the center of the, of the room? So I'm opening the floor, yeah. Yeah, Catherine. Thank you, that was a wonderful discussion. But I want to point out that there is a whole dimension um, that I think is uh, very germane in this conversation of kind of spinning off the evil side of us that we don't want to have anything to do with, except we kind of do. Um, you were saying, Anya, that we didn't, because of this cancel culture and because we put all you know, the vagaries of our identity out there, we have to prove ourselves, et cetera. There's a lot of Mr. Hyde on the internet. Yes. And I see that's where I think Absolutely. there is a possibility of a really hideous identity that people have that it's weirdly both public and private. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, that's when they're anonymous, right? It's when it's the anonymous or, comments. Or you have a pseudonym, but I think a lot of people play out a hide like existence <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> yeah, but especially when they're anonymous and they're hidden behind anonymity and then they, they become vicious. They yeah. become truly evil, they, some of them. Yeah, that's yeah. Great. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the forum. This is great. Um, so, so many things came to mind, but um, I've read and I teach uh, modern European history and I've read and studied a little bit about um, Victorian London. And in those times, it was very common for um, upper class people to go slumming. Mm -hmm. yes. And they would have relationships with people in the East End um, yeah. Another thing that came to mind is that Jack the Ripper was just two years yeah. after yes. this novel. Yeah. And um, so there seems to be a propensity for uh, you know, hidden violence yeah. in the society. But I wondered, uh, uh, Dr. Harrison, if, um, if you had considered the, perhaps um, Jekyll's liberty is only in the realm of science, like that's when he's truly free is when he's experimenting in his, in his laboratory. And so I could read the novel as kind of anti-modern medicine and anti-science. Huh, interesting. Your, your mention of Jack the Ripper reminds me of something that, uh, uh, yeah, about realities emerging. Uh, the play or the novel was soon dramatized and, uh, and the play was being performed at the time that Jack the Ripper was working his woe on the city. And one, uh, because he apparently played Hyde so well, one of the cast members came under suspicion of being Jack the <laughs> Ripper. Uh, he was doing too good a job of it. Uh, yeah. But, you know, again, this yeah. strange merging of times and cultures. Go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to, to that, um, thank you so much for those questions, if I may go before uh, yes, Robert. Yes. Uh, so yes, the, the, uh, at the time, there was a publication in Italy by Cesare Lombroso, who pretty much inspired all this writing at the time. The, the name of the book was The Criminal Mind. And it basically hmm. said that an evil person, a person who is likely to become a criminal will look in a certain way. So we can see in Victorian literature, in this book in particular, how much looks are associated with the inner state of the mind. So I think uh, Stevenson must have been inspired, it already transpired into England, this novel. So on one hand, that kind of fueled up the imagination of Victorians. Then this book really got them thinking about how people were scandalized when they read this novel, especially the upper classes. They thought it was completely uncouth uh, to speak like this of one's inner uh, tribulations in this way. And then Jack the Ripper happened. But uh, of course, it was very convenient because when people, when the, when the, the novel was published two years before that, because when the Jack the Ripper uh, murders happened, people thought, aha, 
of course this will happen. And Stevenson predicted it and Lombroso predicted it. So it's a very interesting constellation of events at the time. They all kind of feed into, into one another. And you also mentioned uh, how uh, Jackal is most at home when he plays in his laboratory, when he creates these potions. Well, in a way, yes, absolutely. He is anti-modern, he's anti-science, just like Victor Frankenstein. Both of, both of these scientists are anti-reason. They don't really, they, they want to show more than what current science can do. Uh, there is a certain passage in the book where he says, just look at me, take this portion, this potion, Lenyon, and you will see how, how far knowledge can go that you people thought it, we were limited by material things, but we're not. Both of Victor Frankenstein and uh, Jekyll uh, make recourse to some kind of ether. They build their laboratories on top of dissecting houses and then engage basically in occultism, in alchemy. So there is this reaction against, against uh, reason at the time, for sure. Yeah. yeah, there's also, I think the house of, of um, Jekyll is very likely based on this guy, John Hunter, who was a very respectable doctor. And he, very much like Dr. Jekyll, he had this um, uh, Victorian house, but he was experimenting on cadavers, on human cadavers for his scientific research. And he would have these resurrection robbers, as they were called, because they would go and dig up the graves of newly buried uh, people. And they would, in the, in the, in the, under the cover of night, they would take them to the backside and he had a drawbridge where they would go into this back room. This is a John Hunter in 1885. I have it here, going even, even earlier, I think. No, actually 1798 or something like that, late 18th century. So this kind of scientific research, that's another thing that I, I don't want to over um, extend it, but you know, I think contemporary um, biotechnology, there, there are ways in which some of our, everything that's taking place even on this campus <laughs> with all the vocation of doing good for humanity and, yeah. and curing so the child doesn't have, there there's so many questionable things that are taking place in the name of scientific research that uh, are hiding behind a mask of respectability and uh, and and doing good for humanity which actually had a very questionable um, consequences so i think we have a few more people here in line Hi there. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ben. I'm an undergraduate here. Um, and thank you all so much for this. This talk has been really wonderful. Uh, I had a few thoughts about kind of the manufacture of identity and some of the, you know, it's a subject that's recurred a few times here, uh, kind of off of what you all said. I think, first of all, this, this idea from Professor Ilyevska that, um, you know, we could, uh, that two might be the, this, this number that we want to grasp for, that we reach for this duality. Um, I actually, I think the novel actually pushes a little farther than that. I think the novel argues that two is, uh, is something that we desire, but it's still not enough, that there's actually a further multiplicity. And you can tell that obviously, because at the end of the novel, uh, the, the duality becomes unmanageable. Hi, uh, Jekyll is unable to keep it up and it ultimately leads to his downfall, right? He could have just kept on going on as Jekyll, maybe not quite perfectly, but man, you know, rather manageably for the rest of his life if he hadn't encountered this. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, uh, Pro Professor Wolf, you pointed to the, the, the point that uh, this, these kind of impulses are never really described. I think that's really, that's actually really interesting and really important. He, he, he's very euphemistic about it. Like he calls it, a, I think, an impatient gaiety of disposition that drives him, which is kind of a strange way to describe like wanting to, you know, trample girls and, and stuff. It's, it's obviously <laughs> not, a, not a very, you know, I, I don't see much, much gaiety in, in those impulses. Um, and you spoke to this idea of, of the uh, wanting to, of seeking freedom in it, of like the, the stripping off landings like a schoolboy and plunging headlong into the sea of liberty. And the thing that I find really interesting is that I think that's true at first about Jekyll, but later on in the, the novel, he seems to feel equally constrained by the Hyde identity, right? Mm. Uh, when, when Hyde first comes out, he's a source of freedom, right? No one knows who this guy is, he can do whatever he wants, but as Hyde develops a reputation and a persona and an image in the public, he's not as free as he was previously. And so even though uh, at the beginning, the ability to change your identity is a source of freedom, as the novel goes on, or the novella goes on, it actually ends up being a, a, just a, yet another restriction that's imposed. Um, and I think finally, you know, to, to bring in this, this point about, about uh, kind of the, the manufacture and, and 
uh, you know, the potion as, a, as an element of manufacture. One of the things I find really interesting is that the source of the kind of, you know, mystical whatever that allows him to actually make the potion work is an impurity in the, the formula, right? It is not actually the case that the formula changes into something less pure and that the most pure version allows him to transform. It is the, the, the version with something that he doesn't know what it is in it that allows him to take on this other identity. Um, and I wonder if that kind of mirrors how uh, Jekyll himself has this impurity in his identity uh, that is his impulses as Hyde. And in fact, uh, Jekyll's identity is manufactured in a way that most identities are not. When we're first introduced to him, uh, he, he, we're introduced to him as Henry Jekyll, MD, DCL, LLD, FRS, which is kind of a comical list of, of titles uh, that appeals to this idea of modernity as you know, a way that we manufacture identities in a way that we hadn't previously. Um, and so, you know, I, I think kind of what, what this all gets to is that uh, my read of, of the, the novel is really more that it's about the multiplicity or the infinitude of, of human nature. There's, a, there, there's you know, often, uh, the, you know, the word indescribable or something like in Utterson's eyes, there's something like indescribably human or whatever that, that you can't really pin down. And kind of this idea that we, we jump from identity to identity, but, uh, or that, that if we could jump from identity to identity, it isn't really any more freeing because ultimately we still have to pick something that... You know, as Hyde, he still has to identify Hyde in a concise, uh, particular way, and that even if there's the inkling of freedom, ultimately it just caves in on itself. And connected to the modern age, of course, you know, we I think maybe uh, you know the, the the solution to that paradox of like we're more free, but we're also more bound to our presence might be that uh, we have more freedom in choosing our identity. We can we can be this, we can be that, but we're ultimately held to account for those choices to. Uh, uh, larger degree. So I guess I don't know what the question mark there is exactly, but that's just some thoughts I had off of what you said, and I'm, I'm curious to hear you respond to it. Thank you. Um, uh, just very, just one, one thought, which is that uh, uh, Jekyll's leap into liberty by taking on Hyde, putting on Hyde, uh, ends up uh, as Hyde realizes himself, um, uh, entailing the most extreme loss of liberty, which is uh, the scaffold. It's fear of scaff the scaffold that sends him back into Jekyll. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and so, yeah. Right. In fact, we don't know who commits suicide in which part of the personality is, uh, whether it was Hyde who fearing, you know, the gallows, or whether it was Jekyll in order to mm -hmm. free himself from, from, this, from this dilemma he's in. Yep. But um, yeah, and when it comes to the impurity, I think that's really interesting because the drug, he never realized that it was the impurity of the salt. Mm -hmm. And he really wants to purify. I don't think he's anti-science. I, I think he, he wants a metaphysics of science. He, he wants to be a metaphysical scientist. That's what he calls it, as opposed to Lanyon, who was just an empirical mm -hmm. scientist. And an alchemist. In other what's words. That? He wants to be an alchemist. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the purity is he's under a, a misapprehension that he, he has to purify the potion and he has to purify the good and purify the bad elements and separate them out no doesn't realize that contamination is what makes the whole thing work and we're living now in in the wake of the industrial revolution as anna was saying we live in a completely contaminated what i mean contaminated in the sense that there are so many things now um, that are crossing the boundaries or you know dissolving the boundaries between things and and so we are living in an al a kind of alchemical mixture, these vapors that are described, you know, with the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the London fog, I, I, it, his, his elixir is, is really smoked and vaporized in that. And I, uh, excuse me, just one second. So do we have uh, online I, questions? Yes, but you'll, we have you'll about come, nine you'll... online questions I can ask, Those. we can alternate. Okay. So I... first, why, why don't you uh, ask your question? Wanted... I know mostly we've been dealing with the text, but I wanted to ask how um, Stevenson's biography and his, his autobiography up to this point and his unique life shape, uh, shapes the story and then how the story shapes the rest of his work and the rest of his life in a way. His, mm -hmm. For example, his uh, 
problems with uh, his yeah, view of his own health and so yeah. on. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you for that question. Uh, it's, it's very tempting and almost easy to read this novel through his biography because he, as you mentioned, was uh, uh, chronically sick his entire life. He had some lung disease that constantly made him bedridden. But at the same time, this was a person, I mean, I'm fascinated by, by his biography. He managed to travel all over the world. He lived in a hut of some chief in Tahiti. He made it to Mount St. Uh, Helena uh, in California. So this was someone who seems to have been always after something, running towards something or from something. So definitely there's, there's that aspect of the hide and seek, uh, the, of the game of hide and seek that is happening in his life. Also, he was considered quite a dandy for, for his times. So apparently he was very stylish. Uh, dared to wear uh, velvet jackets. Apparently that was quite a fashion statement at the time. Only Italians could do that. <laughs> so <laughs> so, you, so we, we see that. We see that in the, in the, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of Jekyll, that he's also a stylish, this beautiful young man that yet has these kind of drives. He wants to live a more liberated life. However, there have been some insinuations that perhaps Perhaps he had some homosexual tendencies, but in a letter he refused that the novel be read like that. He said, no, I'm just trying to say that there are certain drives, certain kind of liberty that this character wants to live through. It doesn't mean necessarily that he wants to engage in sexual acts. So he kind of restricted the reading of the novel in that sense. But again, we can read beyond as, mm. as much as we want. There's also one thing in the biography which is a background, which is uh, this this guy, this deacon from Edinburgh, because he was Scottish, Stevenson was, in, um, you know, Brodie. So he was a very respectable deacon. He very, came from one of the wealthiest families in Edinburgh. And he was um, even more than De Dr. Jekyll, the upright citizen, every, admired by everyone. But he had this other secret life, he was gambling, womanizing, and, and, and he got into thievery and, and hmm. drugs and all that kind of stuff. And he went on for years before he was um, exposed. And Stevenson was very fascinated by him. He even wrote a play about this guy, <laughs> Deacon, I don't remember his first name, but his last name was Brody. So that fed into the, um, he was always fascinated by the duplicity in, in that character. So uh, we'll have one more here and then we'll go to the online, okay? Thanks, real quick, uh, f fascinating discussion. Really appreciate it. I wondered at the end of the book, if uh, so Jekyll kills himself and it occurred to me, does Hyde live on? I thought there was a little bit of ambiguity there since Jekyll had written a will leaving his stuff to Hyde. They were described as being very physically different. Jekyll was a big guy, Hyde was a little guy. And the instant reaction might be, well, no, that's impossible to have a physical split like that. What kind of technology would that require? But as you've discussed, the book was set in a world of emerging mysterious technology. So I did think that that question was left open at the end that Hyde might have escaped into the world and maybe he's here tonight. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> Although it seems that Hyde is the one who dies in front of the eyes of Uterson and Poole. Oh, does he? Yeah, it's not Jekyll. No, it's not Jekyll. At least okay. it's Jekyll who dies in the guise of Mr. Hyde. Right. Hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. I As his audience. clothes are too his big and look funny big. on the corpse. Yeah. Um, That's not very logical there. Yeah. Okay. One thing that's interesting, you know, bringing up just, I, you know, we're talking about a his book, not about his life, but one of the things that intrigued me in reading about Stevenson was that uh, the men in his family were all lighthouse designers. What a great profession. They all, that was what they, anyway. Can we hear, uh, there was one more question by Andrew. Andrew, you want to come? Yeah. 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 Wait, wait till you get to the mic, Andrew. <laughs> I know Andrew. He, uh, he did I, Dante. It's, it's actually patience. I think impatience is, is thematically and formally very important in this book as well. Uh, Can you get a little closer to the mic? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, first of all, there's the, the, the whole, you know, the, 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 the addict who's jonesing for, for his fix. There's the impatience there. 
There's the impatience of uh, the, the form, the, this kind of detective mystery, the author is constantly making us impatient. It seems ridiculous at points when we have to like read, when he, when he instructs, uh, Utterson to read the letters in order, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, and he's going to wait until <laughs> it, so there's, there's the element of impatience there. Uh, and also this is a novel, but it's not really a novel. It's a very, it's a short, it's a, it's a, an attenuated uh, novel. Uh, so I, I don't know. And I wonder, Anna, cause you, you've been talking about, the, you know, the, if this is a kind of historically determined work, if, if, if this theme of impatience uh, and you know, and 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 Hyde, when he's when Jekyll becomes Hyde, uh, he's an that that's one of the, the, the main qualities of he, he's extremely impatient. He runs over the young girl, uh, you know, and and he, he needs to get his drugs. So, and I wonder if this is somehow tied to what you were talking about earlier: industrialism, the kind of accelerated pace of life uh, that's emerging in the nineteenth century. Uh, it just seems like impatience is such a is such an important yeah. part of this. But I, I think that uh, Hyde even says uh, in his confession, or Jekyll in his confession says, uh, you know, what my greatest flaw is 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 is, yeah. is, is, is impatience. Hmm. Uh, so I don't know. I, I Anna's, you know, nineteenth century talk got me thinking about maybe obviously impatience is you know universal perennial human problem, but quality but is there something about this historical period uh that's 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 leading stevenson to connect it with this kind of this hedonistic side you know uh the the hide side of of of, of the, the individual yeah. yeah thank you andrew that's a really great point i mean you're right on page 45 when henry jekyll is giving his full statement of the case he said basically that the worst of my faults, as uh, Toby mentioned before, uh, was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition. Really? That's his worst fault, that he's impatient and he's kind of happy-go-lucky? <laughs> so that, that seems to be his biggest criticism on himself. And the novel seems to say, well, don't be impatient. Things aren't what they seem at face value. People are like labyrinths. They have all these houses, these doors that connect to, to courtyards. There are cellars, corridors that we all need to inspect very, very carefully in order to arrive at a final conclusion about whether Jackal is good in the first place, right? And he's not, as if we if we bring it down the narrative to a point, he's not the, the good guy that he seemed to be. But yeah, I could I I would be very willing to read it as a kind of statement against impatience and um, uh, which comes with the acceleration of the train travel. People thought that they were traveling so fast by 20 miles an hour, right? So this is this idea that the world is going way too fast. We're going down towards progress. So yes, his main criticism is that one shouldn't run to conclusions and the reader is forced to be patient by inserting, by uh, Stevenson inserting all these letters within letters envelopes that's going to be read then and not because then uh so we keep reading and asking and really really ask to like hold back before the conclusion comes so yeah i i think i would agree with that reading yeah i think there's no doubt that every great novel requires a great deal of patience <laughs> and you know you read you read something like that and then you understand what a classic is a yeah. classic is a book where you have the impression wait a minute no one has really read this work very carefully because yeah. there's so much there that no one ever talks about. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, um, you know, when I read it the first time, I said, this is not at all the kind of novel I thought it was going to be. And I reread it and then reread it again for our session. And there's so much terra incognita that I still am not aware of. So patience as a reader is... Uh, and this is maybe the tragedy of the writer, Toby, is that you know, great writers put so much into their, their work and how many truly patient readers out there can do justice to uh, you know, these, these great uh, narratives that are full of textual details and pockets of silence, the unspoken, the suggested, the symbols, uh, the, you know, the, um, implications and so forth so well writers can take comfort in the fact that readers will always find things in the novel that aren't in there yeah <laughs> <laughs> so.
Cynthia, or do we have any Q and A's there? We've got 17 questions oh, wow. now, so they're piling up on us. Um, so Can't hear you very well, though. What? Can you, Can you get close to the mic? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sarah Nick, that this works. Sarah Abraham asked, this novel is a lot about science experience. The process of transforming Jekyll into Hyde is described pretty well, but not the opposite process. Why is it so easy for him to transform into Hyde, but not consistent and easy getting back to Jekyll? I'll, 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 well, I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll refer to Dante. The gates of hell are wide open. They, you don't have to make any effort. All you have to do is let yourself <laughs> be carried by the force of gravity and, and you just descend into uh, this gaping uh, realm of hell. When you get to purgatory in the mountain, it's very laborious to climb you know, the mountain and the gates of purgatory are <laughs> locked shut and they open very rarely, Dante says. So in a certain sense, yes, it's so much easier to transform into hide than, than the other way around. I think that answered it excellently. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Um, the good uh, Stanford doctor, Bar Taylor, asked, what about addiction? In the end, Dr. Jekyll is addicted to the sensual erotic experience of Hyde. Someone else down below content, uh, commented on addiction as a theme too. Um, I can read that one as well. Addiction has only been lightly touched upon. However, I think it was a much more important theme and driver of Jekyll. He couldn't help himself much like an addict. Any thoughts? Yeah, I thought it was very almost overtly uh, allegorical that it's an, he has an addiction to the Hyde side of himself. Exactly. He's completely, all the, he has all the behavior of a junkie, yeah. right? you know, and um, the, and the way it's written, it could almost be like a trapped, yeah. uh, you know, the description of his, as someone put it, jonesing for his fix, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, that that high that he gets from being Hyde is, uh, uh, it's yeah. why it's easier for him. You know, he doesn't, he wants to be there. He doesn't yeah. want to be back at Jekyll. Yeah. Uh, I think Stevenson himself was somewhat addicted to morphium and it was just, mm -hmm. The romantics really experimented with right. drugs left and right. It was just what they did. So, it and of, he's roughly yeah. contemporary with Thomas De Quincey and uh, and others who wrote about this sort of thing. Yeah. Right. So it's about closing time. Do you have any one or two more, Cynthia? Sure. Or anyone um, from this is from Daniel Roebuck. With COVID and extension of plagues and literatures from Sophocles to Boccaccio to Camus and with, and, uh, with Stevenson on death's door when he was writing Jekyll and Hyde, what is this novel saying about public illness, pariahs and global fear? Sure. I mean, what? yeah, I mean, I think it, it just, if we want to talk about public illness, we have to kind of talk about the subconscious, the unconscious, the idea of people having uh, of madness that, that is being dealt with at the time. I mean, Stevenson in so many ways anticipated Freud's idea of the of the unconscious in this novel. So if, if we can read this novel from that point of view, from the point of view of illness, is that perhaps for the, not for the first time, but it particularly, it does a good job at presenting something that might be perceived as an illness merely as another facet of someone's character. That's how I would read it. I, I, would, I would have to think about this more, but I think if we're speaking of certain kind of hysteria or certain kind of, um, yeah, mental illness, I mean, very often I think Lanyon describes him and he's, he's lost his mind, he's, he's out of his mind, right? So there's a kind of accusation that, that perhaps Jekyll is just schizophrenic or is like becoming, he's losing his mind. So it could be read from the perspective, from a clinical kind of perspective uh, and connected to, to the, the kind of the idea of public illness and how we deal with it today. And that needs to be hidden and repressed at the time of the Victorian times uh, from, from sight of, of respectable society, yeah. That's... But again, I'm going to try to take it beyond personal psychology and say that Lanyon, what is it that horrifies Lanyon? It's that he sees in Hyde 
that He's whatever himself. evil mm -hmm. Hyde represents is inside Jekyll, mm -hmm. who is respectable like he is. And he's seeing into that same thing in him, the potentiality in himself of having this otherness. Yeah. And therefore you have to generalize that there, there, this great disorder of the appetites applies not just to individuals, but it applies to a society yeah. as a whole. I mean, think of London, you have the rich, you have the poor, you have the, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a completely schizophrenic city yeah. and it is disordered. There's an illness, there's a social, illness that is part of the industrial revolution. And, you know, if you read about the conditions under which the victims in Whitechapel and the Jack the Ripper, those victims, that, that neighborhood and, and the reality was so degraded yeah. and so completely sick that, and that sickness, you know, existed side by side with the wealthiest um, empire on earth at the time, right. which was the British empire. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that, it, 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 we're speaking about conditions of social ill that uh, it depends on where you want to draw the, draw the line of uh, if you want to limit it to human psychology or you're going to take it to the social realm sure. and take it to the national level yeah. as well. I mean, it's time the positivist idea of this religion of humanity was dominant. Yes. People want to feel themselves as part of a larger humanity to do good, especially in the European context, the Western European context. But at the same time, Britain was an empire, right? right. Engaging colonization. So you have this, what, what's, what seems on the surface and what is hiding underneath. So of course, yeah, we can extend it to a political yeah. level for sure. And of course, mm -hmm. Joseph Conrad, just mm -hmm. a couple of years later, writes Heart of Darkness, right. which is about Kurtz, the great enlightened European, wants to go bring uh, light and enlightenment to the dark um, continent of, and he, he becomes, you know, descends into a kind of bestiality mm -hmm. where the truest thing he says, exterminate all the brutes, exterminate the, brutes. Exterminate yeah. the brutes. And he's the highest representative of Western civilization who succumbs to this kind of barbarity mm -hmm. where yeah. it's more savage than any native in Africa yeah, yeah. In, in that in that but this narrative. is kind of this is kind of where where I how I read this novel and in general the tendency to write this type of novel at the time that it has to do and forgive me for always playing the same uh, keyboard key <laughs> whatever um, that it has to do with technology somehow the presence of science the presence of technology at the time allows for these disparities in society and in humans to come to the fore it is a vehicle that allows for these differences to be parsed out at the time. And I think that wouldn't have been possible in an earlier time. Yeah. Well, I think it's technology plus uh, exploration and empire, mm -hmm. which impurifies, you know, mm -hmm. it brings different peoples, different ethnic things all you know, mm -hmm. yeah. together. And it's through that sort of exposure to the diversity of uh, different human groups and their commingling and their pr promiscuity within the urban metropolis, yeah. along with the technology that made all that possible that um, uh, Jekyll's drug is that salt, that impure salt that is the secret to the solution is, 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 is a great symbol. I think it's a great yeah. symbol. Last word, Toby? No. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have the last word. Huh. Um, in, in reading this, uh, I couldn't help think about another uh, literary double personality, that of uh, Dorian Gray. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in, in Dorian, of course, we have someone who's physically perfect, and yet it, it's this inner state that uh, descends into this sort of depravity, which is revealed by the, by the portrait, whereas Jekyll, as Hyde, who is both physically and um, spiritually uh, decadent. So I, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, the sort of parallels you see between these two kinds of novels. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, Dorian Gray and also Oscar Wilde. It's, it's impossible not to think of Oscar Wilde and what happened to him, uh, even in his own personal um, the exposition of, of his uh, so-called um, gross indecency, the law under which he was himself, you know, first prosecuted. Um, 
we had a session here a few years ago on Dostoevsky's The Double. We read, um, we read The Double a few years ago. That's another kind of story, but Dorian Gray is one that I'm gonna to have to reread myself to, to um, kind of make the connection, but I think you're absolutely right that there's, um, yeah. it's also the question of the oldness of the age. It's mm -hmm. so interesting that Jekyll is not only, I mean, Hyde is not only smaller, he seems much younger. Yeah. He's much younger than Jekyll, and that uh, could be yeah. because he's been repressed or, yeah. or he's, yeah. it's youthful indiscretions that he represents. But there's also this weird thing about the evolutionary, because Darwin has, at the same time, you know, in, in the 70s, he writes The Descent of Man, I think, is when it gets published, yeah. uh, two decades earlier. And the idea that Hyde might represent an evolutionary antecedent stage of our you know, uh, mm -hmm. development, Just to, that we have a, a degradation going back there, that he, that would make Hyde the oldest yep. element in our, mm -hmm. uh, let's say our phylogeny mm -hmm. as, a, as a human species. Yeah. And yet he has all this youthful energy, which is yeah. what, it, that's a drug. You see, it's that incredible hypercharge of energy that um, yeah. I think Jekyll is addicted to. Yep. And the funny word that he uses about Hyde, he's happier. Yep. Yes. He's happier yeah. than Jekyll. Yeah. That's why he goes. And of course, right on the horizon is Friedrich Nietzsche writing in the same years about uh, the kind of oppression that the morality of the Christian cum uh, yeah. bourgeois, modern bourgeois morality and this idea that we have to, you know, that is suppressing the inner uh, vitality of the will to power and so forth. Yeah. Where he speaks about the gay science, this cheerfulness of, of um, being beyond good and evil, as it were. No, right? Right. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming up here in person. Thank you, uh, those of you who are online, and we hope to be with you again in September. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.